Hi everyone, I'm Mayor Tom Bernard from the City of North Adams, and I have the pleasure of joining you as part of the Jumpstart Read for the Record program. One of my favorite things as mayor is to go into classrooms and visit with our students and read to and with them. And unfortunately, I haven't been able to do that for quite some time. We've all had to make some adjustments and some changes. And one of the adjustments we've made is to do our reading in this way, to tape the, the story reading and to have it and the reading together on video. So that's what we're gonna do today. And our book for this year, for the Jumpstart program, is Amy Wu and the Patchwork Dragon. The book was written by Kat Zhang and illustrated by Charlene Chua. So let's get started. Get my angle right there. During story time, Ms. Mary reads Amy's class a book about dragons. Dragons that hoard treasure. Dragons that blow fire. Dragons that fight knights in gleaming armor. Afterward, she tells everyone to make their own dragons. Make them special, she says. Make them yours. Sam, oh, sorry. Sam draws a dragon with enormous teeth. He crafts wings from postage stamps. Willa sculpts a dragon with a big fat belly. She strings daisies for the tail. Amy paints a dragon with a long, thin body. It has horns like a stag and claws like an eagle. Are you sure that's a dragon, asks Sam. It doesn't look like a dragon, adds Willa. Hmm, Amy says. Maybe they're right. I'm sorry. She scribbles with her pencil and doodles with her crayons. She glues beads to the paper and some to her hair. Bits of dragons emerge. Dragons with shiny green scales. Dragons with leathery wings. They look great. They, just, they look just like the dragons in Ms. Mary's book. But... None of them work. None of them feels quite right. The dragons are not the dragons Amy wanted to make. Time to clean up, says Ms. Mary. I'm not done, cries Amy. The rest of the class put their dragons on the show and tell table. But there's nothing from Amy. Nothing at all. Willa and Sam come over after school, but Amy can't even smile. Oh dear, says Amy's grandma. Why the sad face? So Amy tells her. Her grandma gets a twinkle in her eye. Come, she says, let me tell you a story. This is what we call a story within a story. She tells them about dragons that bring down the rain, dragons that are wise and just. Dragons that fly without wings. Looks like the one that Amy drew in the, in the class. Amy runs to the attic. She remembers where she got the idea for her dragon. 
She pulls out something red and yellow, something with a big fat snout and golden horns. A dragon, gasps Sam and Willa. A dragon, agrees Amy. Amy's grandma puts on the costume's head and Amy puts on the tail. Together, they dance down the attic steps and roar through the house. Maybe you can bring it to school, says Sam. Please, please bring it to school, begs Willa. Hmm, says Amy. She thinks about the dragons in Ms. Mary's book. She thinks about the dragons in Grandma's story. Bringing this dragon to class would be great, but there's something missing, something to make the dragon Amy's. After Sam and Willa go home, Amy begins to plan. She shows her sketches to her family. Will you help me? She asks. They measure out fabric and cut it into shape. They carve a cardboard frame and fasten the cloth. Amy knots together three silk scarves, and then she adds some beads and some glitter, and a little more glitter, just because. And I think we all know you can never have too much glitter. Ready, asks Grandma. Amy takes a deep breath. Ready, she says. Amy comes to school with a big paper bag. The other children gather around. Is it your dragon, asks Willa. Show us, cries Sam. Amy puts on the dragon's head. She invites Willa and Sam beneath the dragon's tail. Together they dance through the classroom and roar between the desks. Everybody cheers. Ms. Mary laughs so hard she can't even breathe. Amy's dragon is red and yellow. It has a big fat snout and golden horns. It has enormous green wings and a tail of three silk scarves and beads and glitter, lots of glitter. It works splendidly. It just feels right. It's exactly the dragon Amy wanted to make. And that's the end of Amy Wu and the Patchwork Dragon. And if you have a chance to pick up a copy of the book, one of the nice things is at the end they have uh, some dragon activities for making your own dragon some tips and tricks for making a dragon like Amy's, an Eastern dragon. And it says, the Eastern dragon is a symbol of good luck and strength in many cultures. It usually has a long, thin body and no wings. Its horns look like stag antlers and its claws look like eagle claws. 
Its body is covered in scales. Eastern dragons come in many different colors and can have a wide range of magic powers depending on the story. Often, they are very intelligent. And then there's also a little piece on the Western dragon. And it says, Western dragons usually have four legs and one pair of big leathery wings. Like Eastern dragons, their bodies are covered in scales. Unlike Eastern dragons, they often breathe fire. Stories about Western dragons tend to show them as greedy creatures that live in caves and love treasure. Their horns tend to be sharp and pointy, and their claws are like lizard claws. So I hope you enjoyed this. I hope you have a chance to check out the book for yourself, uh, and that there, if you have a favorite book or a favorite story, you get a chance to read it, maybe with, with friends, maybe with folks at, at home. Um, and sometimes it's just a, a good way to, to wind down at the end of the day to just find a book and a favorite story. So it was a real treat for me to read with you. I hope you enjoyed the story. I hope you take care. Thanks so much. Hi, my name is Christine Hoyt. I am with One Berkshire as well as the select board in the town of Adams. And I'm here to read one of my favorite books. It's by Dr. Seuss and it's called Yertle the Turtle. On the faraway island of Salamisand, Yertle the turtle was king of the pond. A nice little pond, it was clean, it was neat. The water was warm, there was plenty to eat. The turtles had everything turtles might need and they were all happy, quite happy indeed. They were until Yertle, the king of them all, decided the kingdom he ruled was too small. I'm ruler, said Yertle, of all that I see, but I don't see enough, that's the trouble with me. With the stone for a throne, I look down on my pond, but I cannot look down on the places beyond. This throne that I sit on is too, too low down. It ought to be higher, he said with a frown. If I could sit high, how much greater I'd be. What a king, I'd be ruler of all I could see. So Yertle the Turtle King lifted his hand and Yertle the Turtle King gave a command. He ordered nine turtles to swim to his stone and using these turtles, he built a new throne. He made each turtle stand on another one's back and he piled them all up in a nine turtle stack. And then Yertle climbed up, he sat down on the pile. What a wonderful view, he could see most a mile. All mine, Yertle cried, oh, the things I now rule. I'm king of a cow and I'm king of a mule. I'm king of a house and what's more beyond that, I'm king of a mulberry bush and a cat. I'm Yertle the turtle, oh, marvelous me, for I am the ruler of all that I see. And all through that morning, he sat there up high, saying over and over, a great king am I. Until long about noon, then he heard a faint sigh, What's that, snapped the king, and he looked down the stack, and he saw at the bottom a turtle named Mac, just a part of his throne, and this plain little turtle looked up and he said, Beg your pardon, King Yertle, I've pains in my back and my shoulders and knees. How long must we stand here, your majesty, please? Silence, the king of the turtles barked back. I'm king, and you're only a turtle named Mac. You stay in your place while I sit here and rule. I'm king of a cow, and I'm king of a mule. I'm king of a house and a bush and a cat, but that isn't all. I'll do better than that. My throne shall be higher, his royal voice thundered. So pile up more turtles. I want about 200. Turtles, more turtles, he bellowed and brayed, and the turtles way down in the pond were afraid. They trembled, they shook, but they came, they obeyed. From all over the pond, they came swimming by dozens, whole families of turtles with uncles and cousins, and all of them stepped on the head of poor Mac. One after another, they climbed up the stack. Then Yertle the turtle was perched up so high he could see 40 miles from his throne in the sky. Hooray, shouted Yertle. I'm king of the trees, I'm king of the birds, and I'm king of the bees. I'm king of the butterflies, king of the air. Ah me, what a throne, what a wonderful chair. I'm Yertle the turtle, oh marvelous me, for I am the ruler of all that I see. Then again from below, in that great heavy stack, came a groan from that plain little turtle named Mac. Your majesty, please, I don't like to complain, but down here below, we are feeling great pain. I know up on top you are seeing great sights, but down at the bottom, we too should have rights. We turtles can't stand it, our shells will all crack. Besides, we need food, we are starving, groaned Mac. You hush up your mouth, howled the mighty King Yertle. You've no right to talk to the world's highest turtle. 
I rule from the clouds over land, over sea. There's nothing, no nothing that's higher than me. But while he was shouting, he saw with surprise that the moon of the evening was starting to rise. Up over his head in the darkening skies. What's that, snorted Yurl? Say, what is that thing that dares to be higher than Yurtle the king? I shall not allow it. I'll go higher still. I'll build my throne higher. I can and I will. I'll call some more turtles. I'll stack them to heaven. I need about 5,607. But as Yertle the Turtle King lifted his hand and started to order and give the command, that plain little turtle below in the stack, that plain little turtle whose name was just Mac, decided he'd taken enough, and he had. And that plain little lad got a little bit mad, and that plain little Mac did a plain little thing. He burped, and his burp shook the throne of the king. And Yertle the Turtle King, the king of the trees, the king of the air and the birds and the bees, the king of a house and a cow and a mule. Well, that was the end of the Turtle King's rule. For Yertle, the king of all Salamisan, fell off his high throne and fell plunk in the pond. And today, the great Yertle, that marvelous he, is king of the mud, that is all he can see. And the turtles, of course, all the turtles are free, as turtles and maybe all creatures should be. Hello and welcome. I'm Dr. Kim Roberts Morandi and I'm the Assistant Superintendent for North Adams Public Schools. I'm really excited to get to read to you one of my favorite stories, What Do You Do With an Idea? This book was written by Kobe Yamada and illustrated by Mae Basim. This particular book was a gift to me and it was one that I chose to read today to you because it's a book that keeps on giving. Each time I see it, I think new things, and I go back to it and I remember why it's so exciting. Let's dig into it. One day, I had an idea. Where did it come from? Why is it here? I wondered. What do you do with an idea? At first, I didn't think much of it. It seemed kind of strange and fragile. I didn't know what to do with it, so I just walked away from it. I acted like it didn't belong to me. But it followed me. I worried what others would think. What would people say about my idea? I kept it to myself. I hid it away and didn't talk about it. I tried to act like everything was the same as it was before my idea showed up. But there was something magical about my idea. I had to admit, I felt better and happier when it was around. It wanted food. It wanted to play. Actually, it wanted a lot of attention. It grew bigger and we became friends. And I don't know if you're noticing, but as we turn the page and this idea gets bigger, there's more and more color being added to the illustrations. Pay attention to the color. I showed it to other people, even though I was afraid of what they would say. I was afraid that if people saw it, they would laugh at it. I was afraid they would think it was silly. And many of them did. They said it was no good. They said it was too weird. They said it was a waste of time and that it would never become anything. At first, I believed them. I actually thought about giving up on my idea. I almost listened to them. But then I realized, what do they really know? This is my idea, I thought. No one knows it like I do. And it's okay if it's different and weird and maybe a little crazy. I decided to protect it, to care for it. I fed it good food. I worked with it, I played with it, but most of all, I gave it my attention. 
See how much the bigger now the idea is? As we have been turning the pages, right? The idea keeps get big, keeps getting bigger and bigger. My idea grew and grew, and so did my love for it. I built it a new house, one with an open roof where it could look up at the stars, a place where it could be safe to dream. I liked being with my idea. It made me feel more alive, like I could do anything. It encouraged me to think big and then to think bigger. It shared its secrets with me. It showed me how to walk on my hands because it said, it's good to have the ability to see things differently. I couldn't imagine my life without it. Again, look at all the color now, right? As we've turned the pages. Then one day, something amazing happened. My idea changed right before my very eyes. It spread its wings, took flight, and burst into the sky. I don't know how to describe it, but it went from being here to being everywhere. It wasn't just a part of me anymore. It was now a part of everything. And then I realized what you do with an idea. You change the world. The end. I hope that you enjoyed the story. Again, it's one of my favorites because it applies to everything in, in our life, right, and in every day. So take your idea, grow it, feed it, play with it, give it attention, and have fun. And remember, what do you do with an idea? You use it to change the world. Thank you for your time today. Hi, I'm Amber Bisa, Executive Director of the Northern Berkshire Community Coalition, and I have some stories today. Our first book is Milo Imagines the World. Milo imagines the world. What begins as a slow, distant glow grows and grows into a tired train that clatters down the tracks. A cool rush of wind quiets into a screech of steel. And when the doors slide open, Milo slips aboard. The train bucks back into motion as he and his sister squeeze into the bench seats. The whiskered man beside Milo has a face of concentration. A businessman has a blank, lonely face. The wedding dress woman near the far door has a face made out of light, while the dog peeking out of her handbag has no face at all, just a long, lolling tongue. These monthly Sunday sub rides were, are never ending, and as usual, Milo is a shook up soda Excitement stacked on top of worry, on top of confusion, on top of love. To keep himself from bursting, he studies the faces around him and makes pictures of their lives. At a downtown local stop, the whiskered man folds up his crossword and hurries off the train. Milo imagines him trudging through brown mounds of slush. It's a five flight climb to his cluttered apartment where he's greeted by mewing cats and burrowing rats. Parakeets tweet songs of longing as the man sips tepid soup, hunched over a game of solitaire. Late that night, the door to the parakeet cage mysteriously falls open and the cats gather on the cold sill to watch the birds fly free from the city. Milo tugs his sister's sleeve and holds up his picture but even when she turns to look, he can tell she doesn't see. She's a shook up soda too. A boy in a suit boards the train with his dad. His hair is a perfect part and there's not a single scuff on his bright white Nikes. Milo imagines the clop, clop, clop of the horse-drawn carriage that will carry him to his castle. Imagines the clink, clink, clink of the guard slowly lowering the drawbridge. Across the human-made moat, the boy is met by a butler, two maids, and a gourmet chef offering him crust-free sandwich squares. 
Milo flips to a fresh page at a bustling midtown stop. When the wedding dress woman strides off the train, a band of street performers launches into Here Comes the Bride and everyone on the platform stops and cheers. Milo imagines the grand cathedral ceremony where the couple will be pronounced husband and wife. Imagines the groom whisking his bride away to an awaiting hot air balloon where the pilot loads them in with blankets and blasts of heat. And up, up, up they go, hand in hand, beyond the concrete walls of the city to an infinite blue. Milo holds up this picture too, but his sister shoes him away. Can't you see I'm playing my game? He watches her thumbs bang around her smudge screen and then turns back to the boy in the suit. They lock eyes for a few long seconds and suddenly it feels like the walls are closing in around Milo. The spell is broken when a crew of breakers bounds onto the train announcing, y'all ready for a show? Several curious faces look up at the beat drops and now the girls are walking up the walls. While they're whirling around poles, they're backflipping over shopping bags. When the train pulls into the next stop, they collect a few dollars and scramble for another car. Milo imagines them going from train to train, doing their act as everyone watches. But even after the performances are over, faces still follow their every move. When they walk down the electronics aisle at the department store, when they cross into the fancy neighborhood, Milo doesn't really like this picture, so he puts away his pad and turns to his reflection in the window. What do people imagine about his face? Can they see him reciting his volcano poem in class? Can they hear his mom's soothing voice reading him a bedtime book over the phone? Can they smell the chili cor Colorado bubbling in a pot on his auntie's apartment near the cemetery? Butterflies flood Milo's stomach when it's finally their stop. He follows his sister onto the cold station platform and up the stairs. Above ground, he's surprised to see the boy in a suit a few paces ahead. He's even more surprised when the boy joins the long line to pass through the metal detector. Milo's sister suddenly bends to give him a hug. I didn't mean to snap at you, she says. She takes his hand, adding, you have your picture, you have your picture ready? He nods, feeling the warmth of her fingers. As they slowly shuffle forward, Milo studies the boy in the suit, his dad rubbing his thin shoulders. And a thought occurs to him. Maybe you can't really know anyone just by looking at their face. Milo tries to reimagine all the pictures he made on the train. Maybe he could have done it like this instead. Or this. Or this. Milo's chest fills with excitement when he spots his mom through the crowd. His sister rushes to give her a hug before pulling Milo in too. And it's in this right tight tangle of familiar arms that he feels most alive. When they separate, Milo flips through his pad until he finds the right picture. I made this for you, he says, holding it up. And he watches for the smile he hopes will spread across his mom's face. The end. Hi, I am going to read an early fun to read classic, The Billy Goat's Gruff. And I have chosen to share this today because this is actually a book my kindergarten teacher gave me years ago when I was in kindergarten in the North Adams public school system. I went to kindergarten at Greylock Elementary. So this book is from 1983. It was given to me. Once upon a time, there lived three billy goats. They were called the Billy Goat's Gruff. The biggest Billy Goat was Big Billy Goat Gruff. The middle-sized Billy Goat was Middle-sized Billy Goat Gruff. And the littlest Billy Goat was Little Billy Goat Gruff. The three Billy Goat 
scruff lived in a valley. They liked to eat the fresh green grass that grew in the valley. The three billy goats ate grass all day long. They ate and ate. At last, they ate up all the fresh green grass in the valley. What shall we do? asked little billy goat gruff. There's no more grass for us to eat in this valley. Where can we find some more grass to eat? Big Billy Goat Gruff said, we will go to the hills on the other side of the stream. There we will find fresh green grass to eat. Early in the morning, we will cross the stream. We will go to the hills and eat fresh green grass all day long, said Big Billy Goat Gruff. Big Billy Goat Gruff said, to cross the stream, we must go over a bridge. Under the bridge lives a big, ugly troll with big eyes and a long nose. He likes to eat billy goats and he does not like anyone to go over his bridge. We must be very careful. Very early next morning, little Billy Goat Gruff awoke. He said, I'm hungry. I will go across the bridge to the hills all by myself and eat the grass there. I will cross the bridge very quietly then perhaps the big ugly troll won't hear me. Hmm. Little Billy Goat Gruff started off. Soon he came to the bridge over the stream. Trip, trap, trip, trap onto the bridge he went. Who is walking over my bridge? Asked the big ugly troll. It is I, said Little Billy Goat Gruff. I am going to the hills to eat grass and grow fat. Oh, no, you are not, shouted the troll. I am coming to eat you. Please, Mr. Troll, don't eat me, said little Billy Goat Gruff. Wait for middle-sized Billy Goat Gruff. He is bigger than I am. So the, Billy, the big ugly troll let little Billy Goat Gruff cross the bridge, trip, trap. Soon, middle-sized Billy Goat Gruff woke up and ran to the bridge, trip, trap trip trap onto the bridge he went who is walking on my bridge shouted the troll i am middle-sized billy goat gruff said i am going to the hills on the other side of the bridge to eat grass and grow fat the big ugly troll said in a big loud voice oh no you are not going to cross the bridge i am coming to eat you oh Please don't eat me, said middle-sized Billy Goat Gruff. Wait for big Billy Goat Gruff. He is bigger than I am. He will be along soon. There's the troll. Very well, said the troll. He let middle-sized Billy Goat Gruff cross the bridge. Trip, trap. Then middle-sized Billy Goat Gruff ran off to the hills and joined little Billy Goat Gruff. We got away from the troll, they said, and Big Billy Goat Gruff will get away from him too. Soon, Big Billy Goat Gruff awoke. He did not see the other two Billy Goats Gruff. They have gone to the hills to eat grass, he said. I will go there too. Off went Billy Goat Gruff. Soon he came to the bridge. Tramp, tramp, tramp went Billy Goat, Big Billy Goat Gruff onto the bridge. The big billy goat troll was waiting for big billy goat gruff. When he heard the tramp, tramp on the bridge, oh, he knew it was big billy goat gruff. Who is walking on my bridge, said the troll just to be sure. It is I, big billy goat gruff. I am going to cross your bridge. I am going to the hills to eat grass and grow fat. Oh, no, you are not, said the big ugly troll. I am going to eat you. And here I come. Come on up, said big belly, billy goat gruff. I am not afraid of you. So up climbed the troll from under the bridge. Big billy goat gruff looked very big and strong. But the troll said to himself, this big goat will be a good meal for me. The troll started toward him. Big Billy Goat Gruff put down his head and ran at the troll. Bump went Big Billy Goat Gruff. Splash went the troll in the water. Then Big Billy Goat Gruff joined the other two Billy Goats Gruff in the hills. 
They ate grass and grew fat and lived happily ever after. Hi, I'm Amber Besaw, Executive Director of the Northern Berkshire Community Coalition, and I have a story for you. It's called Big Feelings. Big Feelings. It's time to play. Big plans today. But sometimes things get in the way. Feeling bold, feeling mad. Goodbye happy, hello sad. I have big feelings. You have them too. How can I help? What can we do? Talk it out? Talk it through? I am sorry. I am too. New plans today, and that's okay. We won't let this get in our way. I feel hopeful. I feel tired. I feel frustrated. I feel inspired. I have big feelings, you have them too. How can I help? What can we do? Work together, build a crew. Begin again, start anew. I feel excited. I feel scared. I feel nervous. I feel prepared. I feel hopeless. I feel low. I want to quit, give up and go. We all have big feelings, both you, me and you. How can we help? What can we do? See another point of view? This is our world. This is our home. Whatever we're feeling, we're never alone. The end. Hello, I'm Dr. Barbara Malkus. I'm the superintendent for North Adams Public Schools, and I have the pleasure of reading a special story to you today. The story is called Amy Wu and the Patchwork Dragon. And this book was written by Kat Zhang, and illustrated by Charlie Chu. During story time, Ms. Mary reads Amy's class a book about dragons. And the students look very excited to be reading about dragons. They read about dragons that hoard treasure, Dragons that blow fire. Dragons that fight knights in gleaming armor. Afterward, Ms. Mary tells everyone to make their own dragons. Make them special, she says. Make them yours. Sam draws a dragon with enormous teeth. He crafts the wings from postage stamps. Willa sculpts a dragon with a big fat belly. She strings daisies for the tail. Amy paints a dragon with a long, thin body. It has horns like a stag and claws like an eagle. Are you sure that's a dragon, Sam asks. It doesn't look like a dragon, says Willa. Hmm, Amy says. Maybe they're right. 
Amy scribbles with her pencil and doodles with her crayons. She glues beads to the paper and some to her hair. Bits of dragons emerge, dragons with shiny green scales, dragons with leathery wings. They look great. They look just like the dragons in Ms. Mary's book. But none of them work. None of them feel quite right. These dragons are not the dragons Amy wanted to make. Time to clean up, says Ms. Mary. I'm not done, cries Amy. The rest of their class put the dragons on the show and tell table, but there's nothing from Amy, nothing at all. Willa and Sam come over after school, but Amy can't even smile. Oh dear, says Amy's grandma, why the sad face? So Amy tells her, her grandma gets a twinkle in her eye. Come, she says, let me tell you a story. She tells them about dragons that bring down rain, dragons that are wise and just, dragons that fly without wings. Amy runs to the attic. She remembers where she got the idea for her dragon. She pulls out something red and yellow, something with a big fat snout and golden horns. <gasps> a dragon, gasps Sam and Willow. A dragon, agrees Amy. Amy's grandma puts on the costume's head and Amy puts on the tail. Together, they dance down the attic steps and roar through the house. Maybe you can bring it to school. What a great idea. Please, please, please bring it to school, begs Willa. Hmm, says Amy. She thinks about the dragons in Ms. Mary's book. She thinks about the dragons in Grandma's story. Bringing this dragon to class would be great, but there's something missing, something to make the dragon Amy's. After Sam and Willow go home, Amy begins to plan. She so shows sketches to her family. Will you help me, she asks. They measure out fabric and cut it into shape. They carve a cardboard frame and fasten the cloth. Amy knots together three silk scarves then she adds some beads and some glitter and a little more glitter just because. Ready, asks Grandma. Amy takes a deep breath. Ready, she says. Amy comes to school with a big paper bag. The other children gather around. Is it your dragon, asks Willa. Show us cries Sam. Amy puts on the dragon's head. She invites Willa and Sam beneath the dragon's tail. Together, they dance through the class and roar between the desks. Everyone cheers, and Ms. Mary laughs so hard she can't breathe. Amy's dragon is red and yellow. It has a big fat snout and golden horns. It has enormous green wings and a tail of three silk scarves. 
and beads and glitter, lots of glitter. It works splendidly and it feels just right. It is exactly the dragon Amy wanted to make. And that is the end of the story. But it's not the end of the book. At the end of the book, there is a dragon activity as well as some sample dragons that compare Eastern dragons, dragons from China, where they're long and red, with what we know about dragons in the West that have wings and maybe could even breathe some fire. So even though there are different cultures that know about dragons, then they may see them differently. They're all still dragons, just the same. I hope you have enjoyed this story. The Painted, The Patchwork Dragon by Amy Wu.